I'm now joined in the studio by founder and chair of Liberal Conservative think tank Bright Blue, Ryan Shorthouse. Ryan, thanks for making time. Um, you listened to Scarlett there uh, saying he was delivered a bad hand, Sunak, but he's played it pretty badly as well. But he's also just kind of the best they've got at the moment. How does it make you feel? Well, I mean, the Tories are not in a good place and this is worsening it. Admittedly, it was under Boris Johnson's government that the Rwanda plan came forward. Rishi Sunak, when he became leader, could have decided to deal away with that, but he chose to pursue it. And he's now expended a lot of political capital and fiscal resource on a plan, the Rwanda plan, which actually there's not much evidence that it will work as a deterrent. You know, under the original agreement, it was about, I think, 200 a year of migrants that Rwanda is able to accept. And it doesn't accept many migrants. It has the kind of capacity for about a, a couple of hundred a year. So we know that last year about 50,000 people, uh, 40,000 people crossed the channel. So the chances of one of those irregular migrants going to Rwanda is less than 0.5%. So do we think that's really going to be a deterrent for all these people crossing the channel? So there's not much evidence that will work, but there's lots of evidence that returns agreements, for example, the one that we have with Albania, has returned a lot of people who have crossed uh, irregularly uh, across the channel, and that's led to a reduction in the small boat crossings. So Rishi should have spent much more time on doing more return agreements rather than wasting time on the Rwanda agreement. We've explored that topic on this show, actually, with somebody who specialises in a lawyer that looks at those Albania return agreements. And the success of them, Ryan Sabi is still in the studio with us. Um, you know, we've talked about the party also being too focused on the boats and then ignoring legal migration as well. There are a lot of strands to controlling immigration into this country, legal and uh, non-legal. Um, but when you're listening to Ryan there talking about the failures of the Rwanda scheme, do you think that they really just put their focus in the wrong place? I think that they've, they've made it totemic. They've made it a hill to die on. And I mm. think that's probably where they went wrong. You had James Cleverly, the, the, the Home Secretary, uh, just last week saying this is not the be all and end all. You had Rishi Sunak saying this is not a silver bullet. Um, to solving illegal migration. So why spend so much time, energy um, and cost on this? Perhaps they should have spent all the, uh, all the time, as they say, as, uh, um, on, on sorting out more deals, bilateral deals around the world. And that, that seems like they'd be a bit more sensible. Ryan Shorthouse, I'm going to have to use your surname because you're both Ryans. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Shorthouse, you know, your think tank was one of these, the incubators of the David Cameron style conservatism. So what have you made of the way the party has changed uh, as we get to today? Well, you know, obviously the recent reshuffle, Lord Cameron now came back, uh, and so there was a kind of nod to more centrist conservatives uh, filling more senior posts. But at the end of the day, actually, Rishi, despite looking quite a kind of modern, liberal, metropolitan-type character, I think is on the to the right of many of his predecessors as prime minister. On immigration, he's much more, uh, uh, I think, uh, draconian on that. On fiscal policy, he wants you know, to control public spending a lot more than Liz Truss and Boris Johnson did. On green policies, he's a lot kind of drier, uh, he's a lot more cooler on, on, on the green agenda. So actually, deep down, I think, despite the kind of complaining that we're hearing from the Tory right, Rishi is more aligned with, his, uh, with their policies than he is uh, with a lot of centrist conservatism, despite the personnel changes. So it's quite a conflicting kind of uh, impression. And as a result of that, it seems that nobody's satisfied. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm not sure it's a great strategy. He's offering a little to a lot of sides, basically, and not really kind of centering himself anywhere, uh, appearing to. What would the next leader of the party ideally look like? Well, again, you know, he's trying, you know, it's a, almost it's a good thing, actually, that he's trying to get compromise, and he's doing that on the Rwanda thing. And at the end of the day, the new legislation that's come through, it's not satisfying some of the more right-wing members of the party because they feel that we can't disapply the European Convention, people will still be able to go to the Strasbourg court and therefore stop some flights. But now the One Nation Conservatives are saying, well, actually, the courts cannot determine whether Rwanda is safe or not. Ministers will do that without any kind of scrutiny uh, on it, any legal scrutiny. And so they're dissatisfied. So he is ending up in the middle of this very polarizing uh, party, which is fragment fragmented after 13, 14 years. It's become quite a tired party and there is now a big battle which is about to happen in 2024 mm. I think it's already happening mm. for the soul of the Conservative Party 
uh, what that leader looks like. I hope a kind of modernizing, pro-market, internationalist, institutionalist centre-right leader comes forward. You know, the mistake they made in the noughties was it was a long time before David Cameron came on the scene. But once he did, he obviously then got into power in 2010. They need, I think, the Tory party, if they do lose, which looks likely, to get to that modernizing leader as soon as possible to be in the game for the next election. I wonder if anybody will come through the ranks uh, in time. Ryan Shorthouse, Ryan Saby, thank you very much for joining me in the studio.